I'm here at Woolsthorpe Manor because um, I'm involved in a film about Isaac Newton and Woolsthorpe Manor is where he was born and films about great men visit the places where they were born. But in fact, it means comparatively little for me. It doesn't tell me anything as an historian about Isaac Newton. But for most people, they get history as a guided tour, as an experience of being shown around pretty old buildings like Woolsthorpe. And for someone like an American physicist coming from the Midwest, um, his experience would be very, very different from mine because he would be coming from a large, white, gleaming, modern scientific laboratory to this, to a humble, isolated, rural retreat, rather like the famous American myths about their presidents coming from log cabins or whatever. And he would see that the whole of modern science, Newton's creation, was born in this isolated and natural environment. And so just as people receive information about history through the guided tours they get shown around, so these physicists will get the messages the way medieval pilgrims coming to medieval shrines were given messages by visiting those shrines, by laying their hands on the relics of their saints. Newton is a secular saint of science. And the main relic that survives, of course, is the famous apple tree standing here in the garden of Woolsthorpe Manor and tourists will assemble around the apple tree to experience and empathize with that great scientist living here in his isolation in this beautiful English countryside so far away from modern science but so close to nature through that crucial apple. This whole myth of the tree is based on a very slender piece of evidence, which is uh, the story of Newton, uh, the age of 84, very old man sitting in his sunny garden in Kensington, reminiscing to his friend William Stukeley about the circumstances he was in when he discovered the law of gravity. And of course, Stukeley's story is useless for an historian because Stukeley is yet another part of the Newton industry. Stukeley was trying to build up the image of the isolated gene and he did so by writing out this story about Newton sitting under the apple tree and having his great idea. On the 15th of April, 1726, I paid a visit to Sir Isaac at his lodgings, dined with him and spent the whole day with him. After dinner, the weather being warm, we went into the garden and drank tea under the shade of some apple trees only he and myself. Amongst other discourse, he told me he was just in the same situation as when formerly the notion of gravitation came into his mind. It was occasioned by the fall of an apple as he sat in the contemplative mood. Why should that apple fall perpendicularly to the ground, thought he to himself. I think what's important about the apple story is that it conveys a message of weirdness, that when we think about an apple, we think about Le Crunch or the French Apple War, or Golden Delicious or Cox's Orange Pippins. But when Newton thought about an apple, apparently what he saw in, in that apple was gravity, God and the cosmos, the, the mathematical principles of nature. And it's that contrast between our experience and scientists' experience that is the really important message that we get from the Apple story. And that's the same contrast as the one that I got when I switched in Cambridge from being a scientist to being an historian. It's the switch from seeing a world of quantity of mathematical models and of calculations and theories to a world of senses, human relations, feelings and actions. Newton's physics works because it looks at the real, common, everyday world and then leaves out what Newton decides is irrelevant and goes on to make an abstract model of what is left. That model tells the physicist what ought to happen in nature. The first law of motion. Every body continues in a state of rest or of uniform motion in a straight line unless acted on by an external force. The second law, the rate of change of motion of a body is proportional to the force impressed upon it. The third law of motion, 
to every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Five, four, three, two. We have ignition. Commit liftoff. We have liftoff. Slowly, slowly. This is launch control. We have to clear the tower. In mathematics, Newton developed the powerful new tool of calculus, which is used even today to describe the motion of rockets through space. In astronomy, Newton used maths and physics to describe the solar system as though it were a machine moved by the single guiding power of universal gravity. In his work on light, Newton broke white light up into the colors of the spectrum and then described mathematically the way in which colors are formed. So the world of nature was a resource which Newton exploited. The triumph of Newton's science was a triumph of quantity and mathematical order over the world of senses and feelings. Nature was now measured and numbered. 